Hello, health champions. Today, we're going to talk about the number one absolute best predictor for when you'll get diabetes. And in order to understand this predictor, we need to understand the diagnosis of diabetes. And unfortunately, diabetes is becoming so prevalent, so common, that most people will probably develop it as they get older. But if you're watching this video, chances are that you are on your way to not becoming most people. You can avoid this if you know how. Now, fasting blood glucose is the standard way that they diagnose this. And they say normal is less than 100, but we don't ever want to let it get to 100 because then we're already well on our way there. Pre-diabetes, they say, is 100 to 125 on fasting glucose, and that means they're measuring glucose when you haven't eaten anything in about 12 hours. And diabetes, they classify as anything over 126 milligrams per deciliter. And if your blood work comes in millimoles, then you just divide these numbers by 18. The second measurement is hemoglobin A1c, and it's also about glucose, but instead of just measuring what it is in a specific moment, we're measuring something that evaluates a three-month average. So as glucose swims around in the bloodstream, some of it sticks to the proteins in the red blood cells, and that's called the hemoglobin A1c. And normal is anything less than 5.7. Again, I think a good range would be 4.8 to 5.3. Pre-diabetes would be 5.7 to 6.5. And diabetes is anything over 6.5. So again, it's a glucose measurement, but it's measuring an average. So it's a whole lot better than just measuring fasting glucose. The third one, which is supposedly the gold standard, is an oral glucose tolerance test. And what they do here is they have you drink a solution of sugar, something like 100 grams of glucose dissolved in water. So to make your blood glucose rise very, very quickly. And then they have you sit down and they measure every 30 minutes for how many hours and now they want to see at a certain point that normal, I think after two hours or after 90 minutes, then your glucose should be less than 140. So your body should be able to control this huge load of sugar. Prediabetes means that it can't quite get it under 140, but it's between 140 and 199. And for a diabetic, that glucose is still over 200 milligrams per deciliter. But there's a problem here. In fact, there's a couple of problems. And the first is that when we're talking about diagnosing, that means that by the time you have a diagnosis, you already have it. And that was the whole point of predicting it is to look for the signs and understand it before it becomes a diagnosis so that you never get it. The second problem is that all of these measurements are about measuring glucose. There's just three different ways of measuring glucose. And we're going to look a little deeper and understand that that's not what it's about in terms of predicting. That's the end result that we want to avoid. And now we have to understand how it works. We have to understand some of the mechanisms in the body. So there are three simple questions we want to answer. One is, what brings the glucose up? Two, what brings the glucose down? And three, where does it go wrong? Where does it stop working? Because a healthy person should be able to drink that glucose solution and have it go up and then come down in a timely fashion. But where does that go wrong? Let's answer the first question. What brings glucose up? And we're talking about blood glucose. And the first and obvious answer is that glucose brings up blood glucose. And glucose is a ring. It's a six carbon ring. And another name for that is dextrose or grape sugar. It occurs in natural things like fruit in small amounts. But if you get pure glucose, then it's been processed and refined. The next step 
is called sugar, table sugar. And the way we get that is we attach a ring to it, which is very similar, but this one is called glucose and this is called fructose. And if we link the two, then we have a disaccharide. One is called a monosaccharide, two is called a disaccharide. And the fructose still has six carbons, but one is kind of hanging off to the side a little bit. And this is the foundation of all the sugar in fruit, in high fructose, corn syrup, etc. It's just different combinations of these two molecules, and sometimes they're hooked up, and sometimes they're not. And we're talking agave and honey and so forth. It's all the same stuff. But then the next part of glucose is things containing glucose. It's not glucose yet, but it quickly turns into glucose. So anything from a plant, basically fruits and vegetables, for example, they have sugar, they have starch, and they have fiber. So this is the first portion. This is the sugar portion. And then if you take this glucose part, and I'll just draw a circle to keep it simple. If you take dozens or hundreds or even thousands of these and you link them together, now you get a starch. And if there's a bond, if there's a link between them that looks a certain way, then we have enzymes to break it down. And now we can chop off these little units and we have glucose again. So when you eat starch, when you eat bread and potato and rice, etc., these things break off rather quickly. They start within seconds in the mouth and within minutes, these are in your bloodstream to some degree. Not all of them, that takes a little while, but they start within minutes and that's why things like bread and pasta and potatoes have a higher glycemic index even than table sugar. It gets into your bloodstream faster. And fiber is really the same exact thing again, almost exact, not quite, because we have the same glucose units making it up, only in this case, the link goes, it's like a mirrored link, it goes the other way. So now humans don't have the enzymes to break that down. Cows can do it, they can eat cellulose, that's what fiber is. And they have bacteria that can break down, that have enzymes to break down that bond, but humans can't. So we can make energy out of sugar and out of starch and out of glucose by itself. We can't make energy out of cellulose. And our bacteria can't either, it just passes straight through. There are other types of fiber that our bacteria can use. So most of the time you're gonna hear people say the official guideline, the mainstream belief, is that sugar is a bad thing, which it is, but that complex carbohydrates like grain and rice and potato are really good for you, that they should be the foundation of your food intake. So let's look at that. Let's try to understand a little bit how these relate in different foods. So if we mark starch with red, sugar with yellow, and fiber with gray, then if we take a look at grain and fruit and non-starchy vegetables, so these are things like leafy greens and onion and broccoli and cauliflower and green beans, whereas starchy vegetables would be something like potato or sweet potato, etc. So let's look at grain first. And grain, if we look at it from zero to 100%, it's mostly starch. It's gonna be, in many cases, 75 to 80% starch. There is a tiny, tiny little bit of sugar. That's why it doesn't taste sweet right away, but bread has kind of a sweet taste because there's a trace of it, but then it starts breaking down so fast in the mouth that it tastes a little bit sweet. And it does have some fiber, especially if we don't refine it. Then we look at fruit, and fruit is kind of the opposite. It has virtually no starch. 
in it. There's some, some fruits like banana has a little more starch, but most of the really juicy fruits, they, they don't have hardly any starch. They do have most of their carbohydrates as sugar, and it's going to be a combination of glucose, free glucose, free fructose, and combined as sugar. So there's three different ways that it presents, but overall it's about 50% of each. And then it also has some fiber, usually not quite as much as the whole grain. And then we look at the non-starchy vegetables and we see that it has tiny, 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 virtually no starch at all. It has very, very little sugar. It's usually two to three grams of sugar and it's going to be a combination of glucose, fructose and sucrose, table sugar. And then we look at fiber, which we can't break down, and we see that there's a little bit of this. So now, what we want to understand is that inside the yellow dotted circle here, square, these are the things that we can turn into energy. This is what becomes blood glucose at some point. And with the grains, in many cases, it's 75% and up. There are some grains that have a little more protein, so they might be 50, 60, but a lot of the popular grains, like bread and rice, wheat and rice, they're gonna be 75% and up. Fruit is mostly sugar, and it's gonna fall somewhere between 12 to 15% for most fruits. There are some berries that are a good bit less, but when we're talking about apples and oranges and bananas, they're going to fall in that range of how much of that substance of that fruit, of that food that will turn into blood glucose, that potentially turns into blood glucose. And then we look at vegetables and we see that the things we can turn into energy are almost non-existent. They're tiny, tiny, tiny. So... A lot of times people think that I advocate zero carbs, and I don't. I think carbs are okay, but they need to be mostly from non-starchy vegetables, where we get anywhere from 2 to 4% of that food can turn into glucose. And because it's also balanced by more fiber, there's more fiber in there, that's going to slow it way down. Plus, we have to chew it a lot so it takes time to chew it so that's why non-starchy vegetables are going to raise your blood glucose extremely slowly and basically not to any noticeable or significant degree whereas grain will have the greatest impact and fruit has many many times the impact of non-starchy vegetables but also this sugar is half fructose which if you are insulin resistant and you have some degree of fatty liver, then half of that sugar being fructose is going to be kind of hard on your liver and slow down the reversal. So this is what brings glucose up and next what brings glucose down. And the first thing is insulin. So that's a hormone that we release. Anytime that we eat carbohydrates, blood sugar goes up, insulin is also released because it acts like a key. It unlocks the little gates in the cells that allow glucose to get out of the bloodstream and into the cells. So insulin is the number one. Number two is exercise, because when you exercise at a moderate pace or high pace, but moderate is better because it's more stable for your metabolism and your energy consumption, the exercising muscle if you even just walking, if you get your heart rate up from 60 or 70 to 110, 120, now the muscles act like sponges and they suck up that glucose out of the bloodstream without the help of insulin or with a microscopic amount of insulin. So exercise can be helpful to do that as well. And the third thing is lipogenesis. That means making fat. And the thing that we make fat from 
is glucose. So when the glucose goes too high, this is one more way that the body can bring down blood glucose, especially if you're insulin resistant, then the cells are resisting the glucose to come from the bloodstream. And then another option is for the body to take that glucose and turn it into fat instead. And then also glucosuria. And that's something we definitely want to avoid. This is like a safety valve when the glucose gets so high, when it gets over about 180, then that's exceeding the renal threshold. The kidneys usually reabsorbs all of the glucose, but when it reaches a certain level, then it starts spilling out in the urine, like getting rid of it as a safety valve. Now, where does it go wrong? If there are things that bring up blood sugar and the body has ways of bringing it back down, where does it break? Does that mean that we can never have any carbohydrate at all? Some people think that carbs are evil and that should, everyone should have zero carbs. And I don't agree with that. I think carbs are great. However, historically, our ancestors, based on our DNA and our ability to process food, they had carbohydrates seasonally. Carbohydrates are plants. They grow during a growing season. They don't grow year round typically. They also ate them unprocessed. We never had any processed carbohydrates or food at all. And they had very, very limited grains. They might have been walking around and they found a handful of grains and they pulled them off the straw and they chewed on them or made a little soup or cooked something with them. But it was very, very limited, right? So to that extent, carbohydrates were good because they could stimulate a little bit of insulin. They could stimulate a little bit of fat storage. They helped us put on a little extra weight during the plentiful season. And all of those factors would help us survive the famine and their carbohydrates would be a good thing. However, today, it's not very limited. We have a grain-based diet. After the advent of agriculture, we created a foundation that everything was based on grains. So now we had a lot, lot more than we ever had before. And then, of course, that lasted for a few thousand years. And then very recently, in the last few generations, We've started processing everything, removing nutrients, making the starches more available and so forth. And in addition to that, it's not just grain, but now we process some of those things into sugar that has fructose. So now we have an abundance of fructose as well, something that we never had before. We had a gram or two or three in fruits that we found occasionally, but now, we have an abundance of those things and we have them 365 days a year. They fly these things all around and ship them across the globe. So we have everything from every part of the world all the time. And now carbs are not a good thing. If we have broken the machine, if we have overwhelmed the system, then we have to back way off on the amount of carbohydrate. So the problem is too much, too long. Your body can handle an abundance of carbohydrate for months, a couple of years even. But when we have it decade after decade, that's just too long and eventually the system breaks down. Now, it's just not only carbs, it is also other factors, but we're not going to go into much detail here. Things like seed oil, other things that create inflammation like stress and corticosteroids, all of these things also promote insulin resistance and metabolic problems. And either way it happens, once you are insulin resistant and have metabolic resistance, now you are carbohydrate intolerant. You, just like you have an allergy, some people can't tolerate peanuts or fish or strawberries. Well, your body doesn't know what to do with carbohydrates at this point. So now the question is, how do you measure that? How do you measure when you have become insulin resistant, when it has become a problem? 
is it by measuring glucose? And the answer is no. And here's the big problem that the diagnosis of diabetes is based on glucose alone, but glucose is not the thing we're looking for. Glucose is the end stage results. We have to understand a couple of more things about how to measure that. So when we get diagnosed with diabetes, the glucose is high, but then it's already too late. Glucose is not the thing that we want to measure. We want to measure a predictor. So here's how this works. We have to understand a basic mechanism that once you eat something, your glucose goes up. And when glucose goes up, your body releases a little bit of insulin. And if you're insulin sensitive, it just takes a small amount of insulin to control a moderate amount of glucose. But if we go a few years forward in time and we check again, then probably glucose won't have changed much. But if we've eaten a bunch of processed foods and sugar and bread, etc., then it will probably take more insulin because the cells have started resisting this overload and the body has to work harder. It has to make more insulin to keep that glucose at a controlled level. And if we go another five years forward in time, then glucose might be up a point or two, but it really wouldn't have changed much. And yet we could see that insulin is much higher. It takes three, four times more insulin to control the glucose and bring it within that healthy range. And then eventually that glucose goes up a little bit higher and it doesn't look like much, but this is basically the difference between a very healthy level and diabetes. So like from 90 to 125. And at this point, when the body fails to keep the glucose within that very tight range, now the body is making tons of insulin. And we might be up at 20, 25. We might be at seven, eight times higher than we started out. So what are we supposed to measure? Well, it, glucose is not the thing that we want to measure because it only goes up when it's too late. And I keep saying this because it's so important and yet, that's the only thing that they measure. Whereas if we measure the insulin, it, we see that it's more of a linear growth. So in this scenario, we might have had glucose go from 90 up to 125 or 125 plus. See, that's only a 40% increase. And it barely increased at all until it was in the very late stages. And this is why we can't just measure glucose. Whereas the insulin went from 3 to 25. That's an 800% increase. So this is what we need to measure. We need to measure the thing that is controlling it. We need to measure the body's effort at controlling it. So there's some very simple blood markers to measure this efficiently. We already have glucose that's measured on virtually every test. And all we have to do is to make sure that we also get insulin measured. So now glucose is the thing that we want to control. Insulin is how hard the body is working at controlling it. So now when we multiply them, we have a much better marker of what's really going on. Then we just divide by a constant of 405 and they just pick that so they would get a nice even number of a really good level is a 1.0. If you get your blood results in millimoles for glucose instead of milligrams, then you divide the 405 by 18 and you get 22 and a half. Either way, a good number should be 1.0. And this is called HOMA-IR, which stands for Homeostatic Model Assessment of Insulin Resistance. And this is one of the best and simplest and easiest way to measure and monitor and keep track of insulin resistance. So 
If you're at 1.0, you're really good. If it's starting to creep up, then you want to start watching it. And you can catch these things very, very early because this would be a HOMA IR of 1 and this would be a HOMA IR of 2. Even though the blood glucose is the same, so you can catch these things very, very early. So a mild insulin resistance might be if you have a blood sugar of 90, but your insulin has crept up to 8, now you'd be at a 1.8. If you have a moderate level, your blood glucose probably starts creeping up a few points, but not enough to be a flag on your blood work. And now your insulin might be up at 12. That would put your HOMA IR at 2.9. And if it's severe, you could be at 115 with blood glucose, which means that now you are pre-diabetic, as they call it, and your insulin would be a bit higher and your HOMA IR at 4.3. And if you're full-blown type 2 diabetes, now we know that your blood glucose would be over 125, but also typically that insulin is going to be way, way high. The blood sugar isn't high because there's not enough insulin. There is plenty of insulin, but it doesn't work properly. And now your home IR would be way, way up there, like a 8.6. I've seen these at 10 and 12 as well. And the other thing to keep in mind is that these are not exact numbers. These are examples, right? So this is a typical example. Some people are going to have a normal blood sugar and they're like they're still at 90, but their insulin might be 15 or 18. And other people might have a higher blood sugar, but a lower insulin. So there are other factors, but this is to illustrate the general trend. Also, these are not the only things. These are a great foundation, but if we truly want to understand insulin resistance, there are more markers. And the next most important would be triglycerides, because like we said, one way that the body can reduce glucose is to turn that glucose into fat. If we're very insulin resistant, then the body will have a greater tendency to do that as well. But these are things that everyone needs to understand the very basics. And if you want to dig a little bit deeper, then I created a blood work course so you can learn everything that you need about virtually every marker you can find on a blood test. And I'll put some information for you down below. If you enjoyed this video, you're going to love that one. And if you truly want to master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell, and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.